election night 2012, yeah. after Romney lost, the role that Trump played, Trump started tweeting, you know, foreshadowing about how the election was stolen. He tweeted things like, we should march on Washington and stop this travesty. We are not a democracy. Now, yeah. that is years before January 6th. Welcome to the Bulwark Podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. Just a few minutes ago, we learned that this book will be debuting on the New York Times bestseller list. So we're very fortunate to have the author, McKay Coppin, staff writer for The Atlantic, back on the Bulwark Podcast. First of all, congratulations. Thank you. Thanks I mean, it's not always me. it's not always that a book about somebody who lost a presidential election <laughs> and is retiring from the United States Senate makes a you know, makes the bestseller list. I mean, I think one of the interesting things was that Mitt Romney had all of these notes and journals and records, and he knew that he wasn't, or he decided that he wasn't going to write his own, uh, he was going to write his own memoir because he figured, mm -hmm. who wants to read a memoir of a loser? And That's yet, right. um, he turned this over to you, and it's a very, very compelling read at a rather extraordinary moment in political history. Yeah, that's why I thought he would make for a compelling subject. I mean, I, I didn't start out knowing that this book would be a bestseller. You know, I, yeah. I just found him personally really interesting. His kind of yeah. journey from presidential nominee and standard bearer of the Republican Party to essentially a pariah in his own party within 10 years felt to me like yeah. a pretty interesting story, but I did not, uh, you know, I didn't know if anyone else would find it interesting. In fact, Mitt would always tell me, uh, you know, like, I don't know who's going to read this. Like, <laughs> like me, my fan, you can count on, on my family to buy some copies and your family to buy some copies and that might be it. So I think I, I've well, been he, really gratified he, to see the attention it's gotten. Yeah. I mean, he has he has a keen sense of, of history, which is interesting. And it comes through in, in, in your book. And, and part of that keen understanding is how quickly famous people are forgotten, how you mm -hmm. can be yep. this dominating figure and you become obscure very, very quickly. And a few decades later, people go, who? You know, I was going to ask you the question, how is he going to be remembered by history? Is he going to be remembered as Alf Landon or is he going to be remembered as Margaret Chase Smith? And then I realized... Even among our listeners, 98% probably go, Margaret Chase Smith, what is that mm -hmm. about? Mm -hmm. Right? I mean, it's, history well, is a tricky thing. It's a history is a ruthless editor, right? And, you know, very few people <laughs> end up getting remembered. He, you know, the where Mitt Romney kind of landed on this question, because I would ask him about it periodically. And he was very much in a mode of thinking about his legacy and thinking about, you know, his obituary. And I think that's part of why he's been able to take these sort of lonely principled stands in the last few years. But, uh, you know, what he, he finally decided was, uh, you know, even if you only get one line in history, you want it to be a good line. And his feeling is, you know, I'm, I didn't become president. I'm not going to be in a ton of history books, but Right. If I can be remembered for these last few years, at least, where I tried to do what I thought was right, even though it was politically inconvenient, even though it effectively ended my political career, um, I, I'll be happy with that. Well, the, uh, the New York Times uh, wrote in a review of your book that the story of Mitt Romney's political career is an especially clear window onto the forces that over the last decade have transformed the Republican Party. Once a business-friendly bastion of conservatism, it has now become a cauldron of anger, fear-mongering, and demagoguery. And there's just no room for people like uh, Mitt Romney. Mm -hmm. Let me just read you a, a passage from the review um, in the Washington Post, because I think this is a very interesting distinction. The easy story to write about Romney today is that of the courageous apostate, the lone Republican senator who voted to convict Donald Trump during the first impeachment trial, the throwback to a vision of a party that barely exists today, fiscally conservative, morally upright, constitutionally conscientious. Washington journalists love tales of party bucking mavericks and Romney fits the part. Yet that is not the sole story that Coppins, a staff writer at The Atlantic, has chosen to tell. Instead, he, you, okay, explores the extent to which Romney wrestles with and intermittently accepts his role in what the Republican Party has become. Mm -hmm. when, when Coppins asked Romney 
if he would still have taken that courageous vote in Trump's impeachment trial, had the senator been 30 years younger, with many campaigns and elections still ahead of him, Romney demurs. I don't know the answer to that, he admits. I think I recognize now my capacity to rationalize decisions that are in my self-interest. And I, I, I thought that was interesting is how he wrestles with his conscience, that you go back to the compromises he makes, the times when he did sacrifice uh, his, his principle. So what do you mm-hmm. think his greatest regret is? Everybody looks back. Look, every single Republican has made compromise. Every single Republican has gone along with something they look back on and go, God, that was stupid. But Mitt Romney, um, in, in many ways, is different. You, t- you disagree with me, Juan, because he had a very well-developed conscience. So what do you think his greatest regret mm-hmm. is? That's a great question. There's a lot to choose I, from. I don't know if there's one yeah. story that he would identify as his single greatest regret, but this the book contains, you know, several examples of him at various points in his political career, <clears throat> especially as he was, uh, you know, pursuing the presidency, where he took issue, or he, he took positions on issues that he wasn't sure he really believed, or he did things to yeah. kind of indulge the far right elements of the party. Um, yeah. You know, he, th- but, but there were also moments early on, you know, one of his first, uh, the first stories that capture this is actually when he's running for Senate in Massachusetts, where he is told that he has to be pro-choice, that there's no way for him to win the election in Massachusetts unless he takes a pro-choice position. He personally is opposed to abortion for moral and religious reasons, but he walked me through the painstaking process of finding his way to a a pro-choice position. Um, And, and, you know, it was, it involved pouring over Mormon scripture and finding loopholes and statements from church leaders and things like that. And you, we, we see that same kind of impulse later when he has to court the right wing of his party. Uh, He told me one story about being uh, up on a stage in Iowa, I believe it was, uh, where he, uh, he he says to the crowd, um, you know, when I when I'm elected, we're going to repeal the death tax. And he, he and he tells me, you know, I don't know if I actually believe we should repeal the estate tax. I, I it's one of those things you just say because you have to say it uh, to, yeah. you know, get a rise out of the crowd. And you don't really know what you're talking about when you're first running for president. But everybody in the room cheered. Right. Everyone in the crowd che- went crazy. And for him. He had this like inconvenient moment of clarity while he was standing on that stage where he looked around and just thought to himself, why are all of you cheering for this? None of you are going to pay an estate tax, right? The estate tax is capped at $5 million or whatever. And most of the people in this crowd are probably not going to fit into that category. But it's, it's about tribalism. It's about partisanship. It's about our side is for this and the other side is against it. So I have to take stake out this position. And I think there were a and lot of times that in real where time, though. Right. Yes. Well, and yeah, that, so that's what's so interesting in about real it. time. Right. Uh-huh. As opposed to looking back and going, oh, I missed all of this. So you tell the story about how he was chairman of the Republican Governors Association. He had to raise back in 2006 and he had to raise funds and trying out these these message. Um he says he wanted to talk about jobs in the economy, right? But the crowd, and this is 2006, they wanted to talk about guns, terrorists, and abortion. So he goes mm-hmm. to the NRA, and he really changed his tone. And he tells you, I admit it, you say things that make the audience respond positively. So you really see how the incentive structure mm-hmm. had already begun to change. And... You know, I mean, there have been other politicians that have adapted to that to slipstream behind it. And at least for a while, he went along with it. That's right. I mean, and it's almost something alchemical that would happen where this because there was this new incentive structure that that would take shape, this new persona would form that, you know, I don't know that in the moment he fully asked himself, is this new persona true to who I am? He was just trying to, you know, win the primaries. He's trying to win the next election. And he, you know, part of what makes this book interesting, my my two years of interviews with him so interesting, is that he's now looking back on his career and kind of, you know, reflecting on 
how his story in some ways is a cautionary tale because he sees all of his Republican colleagues continuing to do this, right? In the Trump era, mm -hmm. um, that he can Every see day. them, he can see them rationalizing in real time. Uh, you know, uh, no, I don't really think that Trump is a good president. No, I don't think he's fit to hold yeah. office, but I can't say that publicly or I'll lose reelection. Right. And, and if I lose reelection, who knows, will come in and replace me. And, uh, you know, it's, it's important for me to beat the Democrats or whatever. There, there's all kinds of little compromises that his Republican colleagues are making. Romney reached a point in the last seven or eight years where he just couldn't do it anymore. Uh, you know, the, the kind of all the indignities and small compromises of a life in politics had piled up and he just reached his breaking point. And so he, yeah. he finally s decided to be fully true to what he believed and follow his conscience instead of, uh, you know, political incentives. But he understands those incentives and how they work. You know, one of the things he told me was that, uh, Rana McDaniel, the uh, the chairwoman of the RNC, yeah. also his Rana niece. Rana McDaniel. Uh, yes, that's right. <laughs> he uh, he told me that uh, you know he tries to avoid talking politics with her because they obviously disagree on a lot, and it you know probably wouldn't go well. But uh, he said that after after the RNC put out a statement um, in which they seemed to say that. What happened on January 6th was a uh, legitimate uh, political speech or political oh, protest. Yeah. Um, he called up Rana because he was so angry about it. And he, he was like, what are you guys doing? And she kind of demurred and said, oh, no, it's getting being, it's getting taken out of context, whatever. But what mm -hmm. he told me about that was, you know, I understand the, the kind of fire that they're playing with. Right. That they're mm -hmm. the, the people who run the RNC, the mainstream, quote unquote, establishment Republicans, they're all playing with fire. And, uh, you know, they think that they can kind of appease and uh, appeal to these MAGA elements of the party while staying in charge. And they say to themselves, well, if I just cross this one line, uh, you know, then I, I can I'll be able to stay in power. Right. And he said, the problem is, if you're a Republican, the line just keeps getting moved and moved and moved. Yeah, and this is he's, lived he's, experience. He's, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So the, you you write the one question uh, the, the one question that Romney would struggle to answer even a decade later was whether he had been true to himself in his pursuit of the presidency. It, it, uh, why would he struggle with that? Because you know you also you know report that you know when when he he speaks to student groups uh, you know one of the things that Romney tells them is never ever ever trade away your integrity for political game it, it, for political gain. It's not worth it. Believe me. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that sounds like somebody who looks back at all of those compromises, all those times he was not true to himself and he regrets it. So That's why, right. why, do you, why do you write that he struggles to answer that question? Because it sounds like the whole book is answering that question in some way. I, you know, I write at the end of the book that the process of our interviews was often kind of messy, right? Um, we would, it, it wasn't like a straight line toward perfect enlightenment, right. right? He, he would, in some interviews, seem to confess some complicity in what had happened to the Republican Party. And then, you know, the next week, he'd sort of walk it back. Um, and, you know, sometimes he would get angry and defensive. And then some weeks, he would be introspective and soul searching. And I, I think that, he deserves enormous credit for doing I that work. I recognize this, by the way. The, well, yeah. to, I mean, anybody who's been in therapy, who's been in any kind of marriage counseling, right? Like this is this is uh, this is a very human, messy process. And the fact that he was willing to do it with me, a biographer, with it all on the record and without any editorial control over how the final book right. came out, is pretty remarkable. And I think he deserves credit for that. But it, it was it, well, this he is definitely also part of the process, it was hard right? I mean, talking to you. Yeah. So part. So, so you you mentioned therapy, but so part of this process of this reckoning of looking back in his life and, and the choices he made, it sounds like his interviews with you and the process of creating this book was the way that he worked through it and thought through mm. it and came to terms with the decisions he made. Now, I asked you that question. What was the one thing he regretted? And it was a target rich environment. So speaking of those moments. Um, I think I know where you're headed here. <laughs> well, there's there's two of them. There's two, okay. there's two big ones, and I'm really interested in them, which is at the time it didn't seem like that big a deal. But in retrospect, 2012, he's running for president. He has mm -hmm. a lot of you know pressure on him. 
uh, to you know get Donald Trump on board. Donald Trump had been peddling uh, had been peddling the the birther conspiracy theory, and so um, you were right. You know, he was getting a lot of pressure to get Trump's endorsement because his religion, being a Mormon, was alien to voters. I don't know how Trump helps him with all of that. So um, he stands there, and we all remember that moment. Uh, when Donald Trump endorses Mitt Romney and Mitt Romney accepts Donald Trump's endorsement at a time when already, I mean, Donald Trump had not become, you know, the you know dominant figure he, you know, has since become, but it was pretty clear that he was somebody who was trafficking some of the ugliest rumors. So talk to me about that decision and how he thinks about it afterwards. Yeah. So this is a really interesting moment. I, I actually was there as a reporter when that happened. And I, I think oh, the really? piece that I wrote at the time, you know, 10 plus years ago, the headline was the humiliation of Mitt Romney. And it was because you could see he was embarrassed to be there. He couldn't believe that he was standing on the stage with with Trump. He, in fact, when Romney went to the microphone, he uh, he said, there are some things in life you just can't imagine happening, and this is one of them. And so, you know, right. he, he, there were the very strong subtext there was that he couldn't believe he was there. You know, what talking to him about it now and doing some reporting about it, talking to the people who were involved in that decision, um, it was clear he didn't want to do it at the time. He said no multiple times. His advisors eventually convinced him that he had to do this or else Trump would go endorse Rick Perry or Newt Gingrich and, you know, stretch out the, the primaries. Yeah. Um, but it's funny because Romney is clearly, you know, chagrined that 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 happened and, and I'm sure wishes he could take it back. But at the same time, he he becomes a little defensive when you ask him about this in the context of, you know, did you give credibility to Trump? Did you help Trump win the nomination four years later? Because he just fundamentally disagrees that his accepting Trump's endorsement had any effect on Trump's ability to win the Republican nomination four years later. He, okay. he, his, his argument is that Trump rode this, you know, once in a generation populist wave into the White House and that Mitt Romney had very little to do with it. And you know, I'll add this too. Romney's argument also is that I think, I, I, well, let me say to my, my characterization would be that I think Romney struggles to accept too much blame for the rise of Trump when he did more than almost any yeah. other Republican to oppose Trump's rise. And, you know, and none of them accept any responsibility. So I think no, that I, that's a hard yeah. thing for him, right? No, and, and, and I want to come back to all of this. So I remember this, the 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 endorsement, and you know this was one of the things that you know perhaps I imagine his consultant said, "Look, this, you want to be president? This is the kind of dirty mm -hmm. thing that you need to do yes. uh, to become president." He looked he looked um, he looked chagrined as you pointed, but in in his uh, in his own journal, May two thousand twelve, he writes. And this, and this is, is a private journal. Yeah. He writes about Trump. No veneer, the real deal. Gotta love him. Makes me laugh and makes me feel good both mm -hmm. what the, the really so it's, what was that about was was this him trying to talk himself into it was this well so of rationalization well this was after he had accepted the endorsement and, and now trump at this point right. this is a, a couple months later trump was in the camp now and romney was having yeah. to kind of deal with him right and they would periodically they would do fundraisers together he, he would get on the phone with trump some of it was kind of ego maintenance, right? Trump wanted to be very yeah. involved. The campaign was trying to keep him at arm's length. But yeah. part of it, I think, was real. I remember finding that journal entry because Romney gave me all of his journals yeah. early on. I later found out that he hadn't reread them before giving them to me, which is kind of incredible. But I remember yes, finding that entry <laughs> and say and immediately being like, I'm bringing this up with him in the next interview. Yeah. And so I did. I read it back to him. And you could tell he got like a little bit of a smirk and kind of was, I think, a little like cringing over it. Right. But, uh, you know, he, he said, look, this is actually the reality. Like Trump one on one in a room, there is a seductive quality to him. He he has this charisma. He has this ability to win people over. And it's helpful to understanding how he won over so many leaders of the Republican Party so quickly. It's not as simple as they're just responding to political incentives. That's part of it. But Trump also is pretty good at, you know, kind of seducing you. Right. And so Romney, again, though, yeah. I will I will make this one other point, though. 
when I brought this up yeah. with him and it's the, it was the same thing when he talked about winning the nominee or, you know, accepting his endorsement, he said, you know, at the time, I didn't think of Donald Trump as a political figure. I thought of him as kind of this dopey celebrity who was outrageous and entertaining and ridiculous. And he had terrible ideas. But, you know, Democrats have all kinds of dopey celebrities with terrible ideas that they accept money from and endorsements from. Why can't I have the celebrity apprentice host standing next to me? That was sort of the way he talked himself into no, I, it. I, 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 as I read this, I, I had my own flashback. So in the interest of full disclosure... Um, I remember that shortly after this this endorsement, that the Romney campaign, I was on the radio in Milwaukee, you know, conservative talk show, mm -hmm. and the Romney campaign called and said, hey, would you like Donald Trump on your show? So I actually had Donald Trump on my show back in 2012. Mm, interesting. And I remember him calling in. And I and frankly, I probably forgot about it the next day. Did not think yeah. about it. Did not think that it was significant. If you ask, um, OK, well, how do you justify putting somebody on who is spreading the birth of the thing? It was it was the kind of thing that happened that in retrospect, it has moral weight, but in the day to day, you go along with it. And I think that's one of the things that comes through is that you kind of get mm -hmm. sucked into this. By the way, one of the interesting little tidbits in your book that I had completely forgotten about was election night 2012. Yeah. After Romney lost the role that Trump played, Trump started tweeting in a foreshadowing about how the election was stolen. He tweeted things like, we should march on Washington and stop this travesty. We are not a democracy. Now, yeah. that is years before <laughs> January 6th. Uh, but, but, can, but isn't that so interesting? Because I had forgotten about that, too. You had forgotten about it. No. I think most readers, when they come to that portion of the, the yep. story, this is the election night 2012, no. they'll almost have to, you know, check back. Wait, what, what year is this? Right. But it exactly, speaks to yeah. how how unserious Donald Trump was at the time that nobody, it barely registered, right? It was, oh, this loud mouth, you know, celebrity is saying stupid things on Twitter. But it, it speaks to how so much of the Republican Party and political establishment didn't take him seriously and didn't take what he represented seriously. And four yeah. years later, that, that element of their party, that ugliness took over. Right. It was always there. That's that's the thing and that yes. we've talked about before. I'm going to go back to this Washington Post uh, review of your book, uh, which is very favorable. But uh, um, he writes, uh, there's a certain obliviousness to Romney's campaigning, especially so during the 2012 presidential run when the candidates still regarded the Tea Party as merely a movement of fiscal discipline. Well, there, were, there was a lot of people who thought that at least early on. His campaign strategist, Stuart Stevens, who has become extremely um, anti-Trump, anti, anti uh, harbored no such illusions, telling Romney at the time that the primary was not about, this is 2012, that the primary was not about policy or ideology, but about grievance and tribalism. The base, this is uh, what Stephen said, the base is Southern, evangelical, and populist. You are Yankee, Mormon, and wealthy. We're going to have to steal this nomination, hmm. which again says that, you know, he was kind of a last gasp of something of a party that had already begun to change. Yeah. That's totally right. I mean, th this is one of the great ironies of Mitt Romney's career. He's become this pariah, not really because he apostatized from the GOP. Mm -hmm. The GOP just changed dramatically around Mitt Romney within his lifetime, right? It was still when Mitt Romney first ran for president in 2007, it was still possible for him to think that his uh, uh, health care bill in Massachusetts could be a selling point for his nomination. Right. He, when he started yeah. out, he thought, look, uh, the Republican Party is the party of ideas. George W. Bush got elected as a compassionate conservative. You know, th this kind of innovative solution to getting universal health care coverage in my state is going to be something that propels me to the Republican nomination. Uh, wow. He yeah. quickly ran into yeah. the reality of that. Right. But but it, it at the time, it wasn't so far fetched. Right. The party just kind yeah. of changed, it, you know, very quickly and very dramatically right around the time Romney entered the national stage. And what he represents now, um, you know, feels anathema to what the Republican Party is. But it's not 
it's not that he became a liberal, right? The, the, this is the confusing right. thing for him. He he yeah. he still feels like he's a conservative. He still is a believer in personal responsibility and character and values and yeah. you know free markets and capitalism and promoting democracy abroad. Those those are the things that he thought the Republican Party stood for, and now. It, it has rallied around a man who stands against all of that, and he's struggling to figure out where he fits politically. You know, it occurs to me that, that his nomination in 2012, in many ways, was a false indicator because mm -hmm. uh, the party had already begun to change dramatically. But we were able to tell ourselves as conservatives that the center would hold, that, yeah. that this was still the party that would nominate George Bush and, and John McCain and Mitt Romney. So it's not the party of Pat Buchanan. It's not the party of Donald Trump. I mean, they're there, but there's a reason why you know, people like Rick Santorum and Newt Gingrich don't ultimately win. You know, Michelle yes, Bachman exactly. did not become the nominee. They didn't go to Herman Cain. So we're still a sane, the Republican Party was still sane, but maybe this was, again, the false indicator. That, but it's that, because you know, he, that he was able to pull that out. That because he stole the nomination, right? That that because they yes, they because were successful, the right? The the chapter that I write about that that campaign is called Heist, and it's because he he did successfully. He and Stuart Stevens and all those people on his campaign in Boston, they figured out how to execute the heist by the skin of their teeth. Were they able to kind of beat the you know Rick Perry's and Newt Gingrich's and Rick Santorum's? Um, but but he had to do a lot of things that you know were out of character for him to win that nomination. And so there was a personal cost as well. A big part. Okay, so talk to me about George Romney. For for a lot of our listeners, I am old enough to remember uh, George Romney, <laughs> governor of Michigan, presidential candidate in 1968, um, who w was the front runner for a while, crashed and burned after an unfortunate comment, perhaps taken out of context about being brainwashed about the Vietnam War. But uh, he plays a really big role in the formation of Mitt Romney, that that, uh, mm -hmm. that Mitt circulated a really lengthy paper about yeah. uh, how his father had gone from front runner to also ran. So just talk to me a little bit about that, because you said that you, I think you described him that he was both inspired and haunted by the yeah. experience of his father. So just talk to me a little bit about yeah. the role that George <laughs> Romney plays in this story. His dad looms large in Mitt Romney's life and career. He, I can't tell you how many times he would bring up his dad in these interviews and in his journals. I mean, his dad is a really important figure. He was a liberal Republican governor of Michigan in the 1960s. He had been a, pioneer, a pioneering auto executive before that, had turned around American uh, Motors, uh, one of the uh, auto companies in, in Detroit. And... He, you know, planted himself very deliberately in the liberal wing of the party, which still was fairly robust in the 60s, uh, or especially the early yeah. 60s. He was in the mold of kind of a Dwight Eisenhower and Rockefeller, you know. Um, he was an advocate of civil rights. He marched with civil rights activists. Uh, he eventually ran for president. And during the Republican primaries, uh, had to deal with race riots in Detroit, which became national news. And George Romney refused to condemn the rioters, uh, even as, you know, a lot of Republicans and, and his white constituents were demanding that he do so. Um, what he said, he delivered this address saying that we have to look at the root causes of the unrest and address the inequalities that black Americans are facing. So he, he was really quite progressive. Um, he was also very, you know, courageous, almost recklessly so. Um, he went to the convention in 1964 in San Francisco where Barry Goldwater uh, <clears throat> won the nomination and kind of famously refused to endorse Goldwater and gave this thundering speech denouncing what he considered the extremist forces uh, that were taking over the party. And Mitt, as a teenager, was at that convention. He watched his dad's speech then he watched on the last night of the convention as Barry Goldwater stood up yeah. and <clears throat> accepted the nomination. And everybody stood up and cheered except George Romney, who remained kind of quietly yeah. seated. And Mitt looked over at him and said, I knew one thing that if a thousand people were standing and cheering and my dad was sitting, he was right and they were all wrong. But here's the interesting thing. He was... As inspired as he was by his dad's, uh, you know, 
uh, convictions and the courage of his convictions, he also kind of saw in his dad's career a cautionary tale for his own political rise. And for a lot of Mitt Romney's career, as he tried to become president, he he worked very hard not to repeat the mistakes of his father, right? Wow, so First this of all, paradox, this, this, this is like the heart of the whole paradox mm-hmm. because he clearly admired and respected his father. And that, 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 that image you just gave of sitting alone, obviously foreshadows him sitting alone at the lunch table in the Senate, you know, mm-hmm. being Mitt Romney alone. And yeah. yet he was, he didn't want to do this. I mean, this is the thing that, uh, that that he, that they decided. Let me see if I find this here. That the crucial misstep, you write, was George's compulsion to speak his mind and stick to his beliefs. So on the one hand, this inspired him. This was his role model. On the other hand, the point of that paper was, you know what? If you keep sticking to your beliefs, you say what you think. You're not going to be president again. So. Mitt Romney had those two voices in his head, didn't he? Totally. He was always wrestling with wanting to, Mm -hmm. you know, replicate his father's courage, but also wanting to do the thing his dad couldn't do, which was become president. Right. And so Mm -hmm. he, he, he was kind of being pulled in both directions. He had, like you said, a very kind of overactive conscience. So it's not as if he just bracketed questions of right and wrong. He was always wrestling with them. But for a lot of his career, I think you could argue that he was sort of defining his approach to politics in contrast with his father's. It's really been this last seven or eight years where he knew he wasn't going to be president. I think that was part of it. And also his party reached a mm-hmm. point that he just couldn't, you know, morally abide anymore, that he's now really reaching for his father's legacy. You can see the historical echoes in his, you know, speech denouncing Trump, his votes to impeach Trump, uh, even while every other Republican is kind of calling him out and pressuring him to cave. He, you know, th- he has this kind of stubborn commitment to his beliefs that his dad had and that he now hopes that he can be remembered for the same way his dad was. That, 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 that's what makes it such an extraordinary uh, psychological study. Before we get to that, though, uh, when I asked you earlier, you know, the thing that he regretted the most, I don't know whether you thought I was going to ask you about this, but there was the endorsement of Donald Trump. But then there is the most cringeworthy picture in the history of American politics. <laughs> right? um, that after... After Mitt Romney had delivered this absolutely scathing and I think quite eloquent speech denouncing Donald Trump early on, trying to derail the nomination, after all of his attempts, uh, you know, to to find ways to have an alternative to Donald Trump, you know, as you point out, um, he he did as much as any Republican in America did in 2016 to try to stop Donald Trump. But then there's that moment. Trump is elected. Mm -hmm. It's in the transition. And over frogs' legs, is that true? By the way, that they were having frogs. It's legs actually not question. frogs' legs. Apparently, okay. according to Romney, it, okay. was, uh, it was something else. But he, he, okay. he that that became part of the lore. <laughs> yeah, the part 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 of the lore is almost too good to be to to check. But anyway, he's sitting there with Donald Trump, and he's talking about becoming Donald Trump's Secretary of State. How the hell did that happen? And what did yeah, you think about so- that now? Well, he, he he's mostly glad that he didn't take the job, that he didn't end up in the mostly administration. Glad. But <laughs> no, I'm saying that's that's his primary uh, yeah. you know reaction. Like, thank okay. goodness. In fact, okay. I interviewed George W. Bush about this, who who had encouraged Mitt to take it, and he said he really oh. dodged a bullet. Um, yeah. But the, you know advice. what was happening was after Trump won in 2016. Romney and a lot of people like him considered it basically an emergency, right? This madman that has no business being in the Oval Office has won. He's going to be in control of the United States government and we need adults in the room. You remember this argument, right? This was yep. a very common line of conversation heard again in the mm-hmm. months after 2016. <laughs> and he, so when Mike Pence actually was the first one to approach him, Mike Pence called him and said, uh, the president-elect wants to meet with you about Secretary of State. Romney... Um, uh, you know, initially demurred and then eventually agreed to at least take the meeting. And it was because he thought that he could help steer the country, uh, you know, in, in the right direction in this very perilous moment. Right. But it's it's funny because asking Romney about it now, he says he kind of admits to me. On the one hand, there was this noble part of my thinking, which is, you know, I want to be helpful. I want to be patriotic. I want to help the country. 
But there is this other bit line of, of thinking, which is, I just wanted the job. I wanted to be in the middle of the action. You know, he, he said to me, I wanted to he be president of the, the United States. Yeah. yeah. Right. He said, I wanted to be president of the United States. If you can't get that job, secretary of state is a pretty good consolation prize. And so he admits that it, th- this almost was kind of the last temptation of Mitt, right? It was yeah. like the, yeah, the, the last, last opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> the last, yeah. the last Ambition, chance to kind of sell out. the hell of a drug, right? That, yeah. Exactly, and ultimately, the the breaking point from the you know in his in his version, the reason he didn't get this job was that Trump basically told him, "I want to give it to you, but you have to go out there and retract everything that you said about me during the 2016 yeah. campaign. You have to say that I'm going to mm-hmm. be a great president, that you were wrong about all of it." And Romney just couldn't couldn't get there. He, he, you know, he said that would be ridiculous. Nobody would believe it. And I wouldn't believe it. And I'm not going to do that. And, you know, he tried to, there's this, after that dinner, he went out and talked to the press and he kind of went as far as he was willing to go. He said, you know, Trump has appointed a lot of great people and I'm hopeful that this administration will do great things, but it wasn't enough. Trump called him after that and said, you have to go further. Romney wouldn't. Um, oh, after wow. the fact, yeah. a lot of Trump you have to people, grab, grovel harder. Exactly. And, and, you know, I think Graham, right. Yeah. (laughs) Well, and, you know, Romney, I think at that point, you know, he was just too, you know, he he wouldn't give up that much of his dignity to to get the job. And, And what he says is, in retrospect, I'm so glad I didn't because Romney had all these conditions he laid out for Trump. He said, you know, I'll do this if. And, and, you know, you, we have a weekly meeting. Um, I have veto power over ambassadors. That was one of his conditions because he was worried about who Trump would employ as ambassadors. He said, I want full yeah. control over sub cabinet appointments and I want foreign policy to flow completely through this from the State Department. And he said immediately wow. Trump would have violated all of those and I wouldn't have lasted oh, more than a, a few months. Right. So anyway, OK, uh, it, so, it's an interesting moment. So let, let's fast. Yeah. So let's fast forward just a a little bit. Okay. so he runs for the United States Senate in Utah. He wins. What did he think the Senate was going to be like? What did he think his role in the Senate was going to be? Because as I recall, one of the first things that he did, I think even before he was sworn in, was to write a piece for The Washington Post where he said, I may, I'm still a conservative. I'm going to vote for Republican issues, but um, I'm also not going to hesitate to call out the character of the president. I mean, he kind of signaled right from mm-hmm. the moment he walked in, that he was going to yep. continue to be outspokenly anti-Trump. So how did he think it was going to go? Well, he had this idea. And I, he, one of the things he gave me was the pros and cons list he had written out for himself when he was considering whether to run for Senate. And you can imagine, you know, a lot of the cons were lifestyle considerations. He'd be away from his wife and family. Um, yeah, right. But And the pros were issues that he wanted to address. But on, in that pros and cons list, he wrote out a line from the Yeats poem, The Second Coming, uh, that he felt kind of embodied or captured what the Republican Party in the Trump era was. And he wrote, the best lack all conviction while the worst are filled with passionate intensity. He believed that if he got to the Senate, he was, you know, this elder statesman of the party, the former nominee of the party, that he could get there and kind of empower and embolden the best in the party who still, you know, were good people. They were just sort of afraid of Donald Trump and didn't know what to do. And he had this idea that he could steer the party away from Trumpism just by being there to encourage them. And what he found out was once he got to the Senate was that the problem was much more dire than he realized. The situation was much worse. Uh, the, these senators did not want to be steered away from Trumpism. They, they were so desperately clinging to their seats um, and, the, and their power and the trappings and their offices and their staffs that they weren't willing to do anything that might compromise their reelection prospects. And that was really dispiriting for him. And then he ended up being the man alone, sitting by himself at lunch. Nobody wanted to sit with him. I mean, that's kind of. I mean, he ta- he talks around. about going going into those Senate Republican caucus lunches, especially as he became more and more of a target of Donald Trump's, and became more outspoken mm-hmm. about, uh, you know, his fellow Republicans. 
he, he, he said it, it reminded him of the high school cafeteria. He would walk into the Senate caucus yeah. lunches and he'd look around and be like, who am I going to sit next to? You know, he, he often felt when he like raised his hand to make a comment that people were rolling their eyes or sort of like whispering about him. He, he actually became a little paranoid during the first impeachment trial because he would write in his journals that he would see people kind of gesturing in his direction and talking and he would imagine what they were saying about him. I I mean, it, it really was just a deeply unpleasant situation for him. And I, and I imagine continues to be so uh, because he's only become more outspoken, especially since this book has come out. Well, and of course, the key decision and maybe the defining decision of his political career was when he decides that he is going to be the only Republican senator to vote to convict Donald Trump in that impeachment trial. He had mm -hmm. to know at that point that that was it for him. That, I, that he was going I, yeah. to be a pariah, that he was going to be excommunicated. So and he, talk to me about that decision, how hard that decision was for him. And he had, again, had to understand that being absolutely alone meant that he was not guiding the party in any particular way, but he was blowing himself up. He agonized over it. I mean, I have his journals from that first impeachment trial. He wanted so badly to vote to acquit Trump and just kind of be in the mainstream of the Republican Party. Um, he, he would often write about kind of write out the worst case scenarios of what would happen to him and his yeah. family if he voted uh, to convict Trump. Uh, you know, he was worried about the safety of his family. He was worried about, you know, mm -hmm. um, his his various sons getting audited or getting targeted by in some way by the Trump administration. Oh, wow. um, but, you know, in the end, he just couldn't live with himself knowing that Trump was guilty. He had, you know, poured over the evidence. He had taken it very seriously. He felt there was no question Trump was guilty of abuse of power. And he was at a point in his career where he just said, I can't take another vote I that I don't believe in. I can't do this and keep doing this, right? The, the way that every other Republican has, has just sold themselves out. He decided to do what he thought was right. And, and I think you're right that he knew that was so, sort of the end end of it for him in the Republican Party. So that was the decision that he decided that he was going to follow the example of his father, George, from 1964, that he would be mm -hmm. the one man sitting down. In his case, he was the one man standing up. So that was that was a real breaking point for for him. You tell a story that's got a lot of attention, though, that he got a call from Paul Ryan, his running mate. Mm -hmm. And Paul, Paul Ryan, of course, and I, I've known Paul a long, long time. He's been trying to walk this very, very, you know, you know, you know, careful line of, you know, pro-Trump, anti-Trump, you know, staying relevant. So he called him up and tried to talk him into not voting to impeach Donald Trump. So it was actually and, and, the and, last the last call Romney got before he went out and gave his speech saying that he was going to vote to convict. Somehow word had leaked out in Romney's yeah. orbit and. Paul Ryan called his cell and basically said, you know, I heard you're going to do this. Are you sure you want to do this? And, you know, mm -hmm. there have been different characterizations of this call. I heard about this yeah. first from somebody on Romney's uh, who, who was mm -hmm. on Romney's Senate staff at the time. Um, I asked Romney about it. I asked Paul Ryan about it later, who confirmed that they spoke and confirmed some of the essential details uh, without necessarily confirming the full characterization. But basically what, Paul Ryan said on that call, according to my reporting, is um, this is going to, you know, be extremely damaging to your your place in the Republican Party. Mm. You could lose friends. People who supported our campaign uh, are yeah. probably going to cut you off and be very upset with you. Um, are you sure you've thought through the consequences of this? Basically, uh, you know, it, also, Paul Ryan told him that he didn't believe that Trump was guilty. He, he said that, you know. I don't think you should That's vote different. this way. Yeah. So, so there's one kind thing of to say, I'm worried about you. Uh, it's mm -hmm. another thing to say, I'm, I'm actually now endorsing the, the, the Trump position. So there are two, di yeah, two different arguments being yeah. made there. I mean, Romney ultimately kind of, uh, you know, said, I, I, <laughs> I know what I want to do and, and hung up and, and then went out and gave a speech. So, what, what, so yeah. So what is their relationship now? What does Mitt Romney think so, of Paul Ryan, particularly after he, your story broke about this? I, you know, I think that Romney 
thinks he, I think he has a lot of just personal affection for Paul Ryan. In some ways, I think he thinks of Paul Ryan as like a son. It, you could tell even reading his journals and talking to yeah. him that he was much less judgmental of Paul Ryan's capitulations to Trump uh, than he was of other Republicans. And I think it just comes down to him really, you know, loving Paul Ryan on like a personal level. And, um, and you know, I saw that they appeared together at a, the Park City Summit that Romney holds every year um, earlier this year after that story first came out. So my sense is that their relationship is is OK. But, you know, this is one of the tricky things about this book. He wanted to document and I wanted to document the hypocrisy and cynicism that he has seen behind closed doors. And I'm sure it's put a strain on a lot of his relationships, but he felt like it was important enough well, to no kidding. risk those things. Yeah. <laughs> McKay Coppins, it is an outstanding book. The book is Romney A Reckoning, and it is definitely worth your time. McKay Coppins, thank you for coming back on the Bulwark podcast. I appreciate it very much. Hey, thank you so much, Charlie. Thanks for having me. And, and thank you all for listening to today's Bulwark podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. We will be back tomorrow, and we'll do this all over again. <laughs>